take this time to thank everyone for joining us on this very special and important venue as we take the trending concept and place it in its true perspective. All souls matter. We pray that you'll be blessed by the messages and that some of your questions and concerns will be answered by the speaker. If you have questions, please post your question in the chat screen. At appropriate time, it will be passed on to the speaker for consideration. And please remain muted during the presentation so everyone can benefit. The Macalma Church of Christ is hosting this Zoom format weekly series entitled All Souls Matter. And you're invited to encourage others to join us for this series. Look forward to having you back week after week. Different speakers from across the country will be addressing different topics of very great importance uh, to those who will be joining us in the sessions. It'll be an ongoing revival and evangelistic and community empowerment effort to provide spiritual enlightenment and stability during these difficult times. I want to call it a vaccine for spiritual virus. It is manufactured and produced by Heaven's Company headed by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everyone will be able to invest in the stock, but the purchase price will be a currency that the Fed cannot print and the market cannot exploit. It focuses on community outreach, membership empowerment, and evangelism focus weekly as this event continues. It is my good pleasure now to invite, to lead us in our opening prayer, Dr. Michael Crusoe, the minister of the Arlington Road Church of Christ in Hopewell, Virginia. Brother Crusoe. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you, Brother Harris, for uh, inviting me to uh, participate and, and lead this prayer. Looking forward to hearing Brother Marshall on tonight. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. We acknowledge that in you, Father, we live, we move, and we have our very being. We acknowledge, Father, that you woke us up this morning, that you started us on our way. We're thankful for life that you give us. We're thankful for food and shelter. We're thankful for clothing. We're thankful for the very air that we breathe. But most of all, we're thankful to have a relationship with you. We're thankful for the vision of Brother Harris and the McAlmond Church, the leaders and the membership there to provide this platform of teaching and preaching uh, and evangelism to reach the lost. We continue to pray, Father, for the McAlmond Church and we're thankful for their contribution to our, our brotherhood. We pray that your crown, Brother Marshall, tonight, his head with wisdom and knowledge as he presents uh, what's on his heart. We're thankful for his ministry. We're thankful for his influence. And we're thankful that we can sit at his feet and hear a word from the Lord. You are a mighty good God. You love us. And that love has been demonstrated through your son, Jesus Christ. It's in him. Uh, that we have the hope of eternal life. And we're praying, Father, that honest hearts will be touched and honest hearts will be open and that they will receive with meekness your engrafted word, which is surely able to save the souls of mankind. We pray for peace in our land. We pray for those who govern us, that you uh, will open their heart where they will govern in such a way that we might live peaceable lives and we might always acknowledge you as the one true God. We pray for protection in these dark times that we live in. We pray, Father, that you'll just bless us and that we'll be a blessing to others and that we'll always have Jesus on our mind and be able to share what he's done for us. This is our prayer that we ask in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah. Just a moment. 
Our speaker will come to us for the presentation for tonight. Minister John Marshall will be presenting a message on faith comes by hearing. John Marshall was born and reared in Medan, Tennessee. He mentors men, he serves as a relationship consultant, a facilitator for conflict resolution, as a minister of the Grace View Church of Christ in Stone Mountain, Georgia. He's a visionary leader. He has served as minister of churches in Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, North Carolina, and Tennessee. He received a bachelor's degree from Fried Hardeman University and a master's degree in counseling from Theological University of America and has done other graduate studies at University of Memphis and Southern Christian University. He is the author of 12 books. His research paper, Single Mothering Stimulates a Positive Family Networking with Black Families, was selected and presented at the annual Graduate Research Symposium at Memphis State University. He is married to the former Priscilla Jackson of Blytheville, Arkansas. They have four children and five grandchildren. And of course, uh, Brother Marshall has also engaged in very special works. He trains people to write. His prolific style of writing and his access to publishing companies has made it possible for many to get published, including the Macalma Church of Christ in the publishing of the book dedicated to Johnny Lawrence, The Hour Has Come. And now he's also encouraged others and helped them along the way. It is my good pleasure to invite to the podium tonight our speaker, Brother John Marshall. Brother Marshall, the microphone is yours. Thank you, my brother. I'm thrilled and honored to be again associated with the McAlmont Church, Brother Lord Harris, Brother Theotis King, the other elders and deacons, and the wonderful church family there, and to have been launched into this presentation by my good friend, Michael Crusoe, who did the prayer for us. Thank you so much for that prayer. This presentation is not about me, uh, but uh, there's a number of things that need to be updated in my introduction. We now have 15 grandchildren in <laughs> Okay. Since it's not about me, we won't even go through all of that. I want you to quickly to focus in your Bible to Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, that is the scripture that I have been assigned with the topic, faith comes by hearing. First, I want you to let's methodically travel through the verse of Romans 10 and verse 17. I'm reading from the New American Standard and it reads like this. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Did you observe that faith comes and that faith comes by hearing by the word of Christ? No other way it comes. It comes by hearing and one must have heard the words concerning Christ. But as we set the stage for the study tonight, let's back up and methodically travel from the entrance of the chapter of Romans chapter 10. Beginning at verse number one, it states this, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Did you observe, my friend, that Christ was, and he still is, the righteousness of God? 
I want you to underscore that in your mind that Christ is the righteousness of God. That means any religious system that excludes Christ will never bring you to the righteousness of God. Israel, the Israelites, the Hebrews, the Jews intended to accept God though they had ignorantly rejected Christ. I need to say that again because that's crucial to our study tonight. Israel intended to accept God though they had ignorantly rejected Christ. By rejecting Christ, they were rejecting the only righteousness of God. While they were rejecting the righteousness of God, that's Christ, they remained outside of the only access to the salvation that God made available. I think I need to say that again. By rejecting Christ, they were rejecting the only righteousness of God. And while they were rejecting the righteousness of God, they remained outside of the only access to the salvation that God made available. Their lost condition had struck a compassionate nerve in the heart of the apostle Paul. For he said, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. Their lostness, their being outside of the only access to the righteousness of God made a world of difference. So my friend, as you listen tonight, if you are outside of the righteousness of Christ, you are without access to the only entrance into the righteousness of God. Christ is not one of the, he is the exclusive access. It is Christ or nothing. Now, let me pull two significant facts out of this presentation tonight and then give you an assignment and be, we'll be ready for your questions. Looking again in this section, there came a word of faith. The apostle Paul spoke that word of faith. Travel with me to verse number eight. Romans 10 and verse number eight. You will see that there came a word of faith and the apostle Paul spoke that word of faith. Listen to the verse. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. Now notice what Paul said, he included himself. He said, the word of faith, which we are preaching. The word of faith, which we are preaching. There came a word of faith, my friend. Therefore, initially, faith came by hearing the word from someone else. For the Roman believers, initially their faith came by hearing the word from someone else, the teacher. That's what Paul is emphasizing here when he said in the latter part of verse eight, that is the word of faith which we are preaching. But now everyone knows that just because faith initially comes, there need to be some connecting, there needs to be some solidifying so that this faith remains. So faith came 
or rather there came a word of faith. But then there needs to remain a word of faith. Remember when Jesus told the parable about the sower who went out to sow? The seed fell, it came up, but it did not sustain, it did not remain. So then for faith to get us to the point where we need to be, faith must remain. So not only there came a word of faith, there remained a word of faith. Now, no doubt most people will accept the idea that there came a word of faith, but it is so important tonight for us to make the additional leap and understand that there remained a word of faith. Well, how did that word of faith remain? Follow with me again. Let's go back to verse eight. Initially, the apostle Paul spoke the word of faith, the word of faith, which we are preaching. Initially, faith came by hearing the word from someone else, the teacher. There remained a word of faith. The believers themselves spoke that word of faith. Let's return to verse number eight and see that. Romans 10 and verse eight. But what does it say? The word is where? Near you. How near is it to you? Now, this is Paul writing to the Roman believers. And he said to them that the word is near you. Well, how near? In your mouth, and in your heart. So the believers themselves spoke that word of faith. The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. Initially, faith came by hearing a word from someone else who is the teacher. But subsequently, faith remained by hearing the word from themselves, the student. Now, what I've simply told you in as simple a terms as I know how is that when the word was spoken to them by Paul, it then must be internalized. And then they take the word that Paul spoke to them and start speaking that word to themselves. And I'm not talking about on a congregational level necessarily, but I'm talking about on an individual level. Now, let's notice the text for a while. Prior to verse 17, Paul had quoted Moses. Let's go back up to verse 5 and see what Moses had to say. Romans 5 and verses 5, I'm sorry, Romans 10 verses five through eight. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness, which is based on law, shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we are preaching. Now here is what Paul does. He lifted the quote from Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse number 14. This is so important. We have to read Deuteronomy 30 and verse number 14. Listen to what Moses had said. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. Now that is so crucial. The word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. Now, observe how this context connected hearing with obeying. Now, let's go back and read the entire context. 
Let's go up to Deuteronomy chapter 30, where we are. Let's back up to verse number 12. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it. Now notice the last part of verse 12, that we may observe it. Now this is where Paul got his quotation in Romans 10 from. Notice the last phrase in verse 12, that we may observe it. I want everybody to say that with me. Don't unmute yourself, just say it where you are, that we may observe it. I saw some mouths not working. That we may observe it. Now look at verse 13. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea for us? to get it for us and make us hear it. Look at that phrase again, that we may observe it. Now look at verse 14, but the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, and there is that phrase again, that we may observe it. Hearing and obeying were inherently and synonymously connected. Therefore, in the context of Romans chapter 10, as Paul lifted from the message of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 30, to hear was to obey. There was no such thing as hearing and not obeying. And to obey was to have heard. Now, some of you have had that experience. Your parents said to you, do something. And they noticed your behavior was not consistent with what they had asked you to do. And they said to you, did you hear me? Or they may have looked at you and said, you didn't hear me. Now, why would they say that? When your ears are on side of your head, they were three feet from your mother's lips who spoke the word, but what she is doing is connecting hearing with obeying. So it is not a phenomenon, it's not a new concept. It started with Moses. Paul picked up the theme to hear is to obey. Now, Israel was lost, not because they had not heard from the teacher. I know that's the case. They were lost, but it wasn't because they had not heard. Listen to the Hebrew writer. He said, therefore, let us fear. If while a promise remained of entering his rest, any one of you seemed to come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them. Why? Because it was not united by faith in those who heard it. They were lost, not because they had not heard. They were lost because they had not obeyed what they had been told to do. Now let's go back again to Deuteronomy 30, and let's go all the way back up to verse number one. And I want you to notice how important hearing and obeying. I'm gonna read these verses quickly for the sake of time. So it shall be when all of these things have come upon you, the blessings and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind in all nations where the Lord your God has banished you. And you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all of your heart and soul, according to all that I command you today, you and your sons. Then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. The Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed. You shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. 
The Lord your God will inflict all these curses on these enemies and on those who hate you, who persecute you. And you shall again, there's that word, obey the Lord, observe all his commandments, which I command you today. Then the Lord your God will prosper you abundantly in all the work of your hand, in the offspring of your body, and in the offspring of your cattle, in the produce of your ground, for the Lord will again rejoice over you for good, just as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you, there is that word again, obey the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in this book of the law. If you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, for this commandment, which I command you today, is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of your reach. It is not in heaven that you shall say who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say who will cross the sea for us to get it for us, make us hear it that we may observe it. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. They were lost because they had not heard from the student. Now they heard the word from the teacher. Now stay with me now, this is significant. They heard the word from the teacher, but they had not heard the word from the student because see, they were the students. They heard the word from Moses. Some no doubt had heard the word from Paul, but they had not heard the word from themselves. Now stay with me, let me help you understand what I'm saying. See, the word of Christ comes from the mouth of the teacher. The word of Christ comes from the mouth of the teacher into the heart of the student. And then the word of Christ comes from the heart of the student through the mouth of the student. Now listen to this, your mouth directs your actions. I need to say that about 12 times. Your mouth directs your actions. When it comes to the word of God, when it comes to developing faith, God has designed it so our mouth directs our faith walk. It is not what someone else says to us that builds our faith. It is what we say to ourselves. So our own mouth directs our actions. Now, let me illustrate that. Have you ever talked yourself through the dialing of a telephone number? Has someone ever given you a number and you kept saying it to yourself? You kept repeating it? Or you may have it written on a piece of paper and you talk yourself through the dialing of that number. See, what do you do when you say each digit? You say five and you do what? You dial that five. You don't say five, zero, one, and then go dial a two. You say five and every time you say five, what do you do? You dial that five. Then you say zero, what do you do? You dial that zero. You, every time you speak a digit, you dial it. You never speak a digit and not dial it. You never speak a digit and not dial it. So what should you do when you speak the word of faith? You should do it. You should always do what you speak. And that's what Paul is trying to get the Romans to understand, that they heard the word of faith from their teacher. They now must go out and start speaking that word of faith and that word of faith that they are speaking will direct their actions. So then my friend, our faith comes from hearing ourselves speak the very word of faith that we have heard preached. That's why when Paul said in Romans 10 and verse 17, faith comes by hearing, but hearing from who? Initially, it comes from hearing from the teacher it subsequently comes by hearing from the student. Therefore, we could say that faith grows from mouth to mouth. Faith grows from the mouth of the teacher through 
the mouth of the student. My friend, you will never have faith beyond what you are willing to say. Many times it is not that we need to put some more information in our heart. We need to start speaking with our mouth the information that's in our heart. Now to my preaching brethren, to help your members to develop faith, we've got to get our people to start saying whatever it is that we have preached to them. When you preach the lesson on Sunday, if your members don't leave the building and start saying with their own mouth what you have said with their mouth, their faith never grows into it. But if we can get our members to start saying with their mouth what they have heard us say with our mouth, then they will grow into the faith that we have preached. Ever wonder why people have sat for years? They have heard some of the best preachers, some of the most dynamic sermons, but their faith has never grown. It is because they themselves never went out and started speaking what they had heard. It is into your heart, out of your mouth. So then to the audience tonight, I raise the question, are you lost? Are you lost tonight? Are you outside of the salvation that the Lord has made available in Christ Jesus? It is only available in Christ Jesus. It's not available anywhere else through any other system. No matter what you do, it's not available. It is only, righteousness is only in Christ Jesus. So are you lost? You might be lost but it may not be because you have not heard. It may be because you simply have not obeyed. You have not said to yourself as the student what the teacher has said to you. Journey with me quickly to Romans chapter six, and we'll conclude with verses 16, uh, verses 17 and 18. Notice what Paul says to the Roman believers. He says, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became the slaves of righteousness. Now let's notice their journey. At one point, they were slaves to sin. They became slaves to righteousness. How did that happen? They became obedient to a form of teaching to which they were committed. And when they became obedient, they were freed from their sins. It is unfortunate that some people read Romans chapter 10 and verse number 10 in those verses and misconstrue and conclude that all a person has to do is give mental assent to the fact of God and the fact of Jesus that absolutely is inconsistent with the context of Romans chapter 10 and the context of Deuteronomy from where Paul received his quotations. Deuteronomy 30 and Romans 10 are loaded with hear and obey. So what is it that you must obey? You must believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, but it doesn't stop there you must repent of your sins. You must confess that Jesus is Lord in Christ and you must be baptized in water and that for the forgiveness of sins. And my friend, when you do that, you have embraced the righteousness that Christ has made available and God showers you with his divine righteousness. My friend, faith comes by hearing. But that hearing must not only just come from the teacher, it must come from the student. And when it comes from the student, you must bring your conformity up to be consistent with what you've heard. It's been a pleasure sharing. I return you back to the host for further discussion. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful message tonight. We appreciate uh, what you've had to say. I know that uh, you've been a blessing to us. 
and I'm, I'm sure that someone has uh, some further questions and desire more help on it. Now, Maggie, do you have any questions? Yes, our first question is, how can a person know they have the one faith? The, a person can know that they have received what God promises when they comply with the terms upon which the promise is made. Through Jesus Christ, God has promised to cancel out our debt of sin. He has promised those who believe, those who repent of their sins, acknowledge Jesus as Lord in Christ, and those who are baptized. He has promised that they will receive the forgiveness of sins. That forgiveness of sin comes on the basis of their demonstrated faith in Christ Jesus. When one has understood the criteria, and that's what's so crucial, that we must first of all find out what is the criteria, what is the basis upon which God has promised to put us in that one body and we can be beneficiaries of that one faith. Now, we won't see anything strange or different. We won't feel anything necessarily strange or different. But we know by faith, because we have done what the Lord has asked us to do, then we trust that he has done what he has told us to do. Now, once we are baptized and receive the forgiveness of sin, that's stage number one. Stage number two is how now must I behave? In Acts chapter two, when on the day of Pentecost, there were people who were baptized. The text says somewhere down around verse 41 and 42, that they continually devoted themselves to the apostles teaching, to fellowship and breaking of bread. So once one is baptized, they then need to ask the question, what is my future marching orders? They spend the rest of their lives bringing their life into total conformity to the teachings of scripture. And by faith, they believe that God guards their journey. If that help you, if not, I can say some other things if that did make it clear for you. Okay. Have another question, Maggie? Yes. Um, what makes a person's faith vain? What makes what? What makes a person's faith vain? Every person has faith. What makes faith vain is the object of their faith. If one places faith Remember, Jesus said, uh, I mean, Paul writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 17, he said, teach them not to trust in the uncertainty of riches. So if one places his faith in his economic status, his faith is vain as far as a saving faith. If one places his faith in his personal ability, to live a perfect life and not need the blood of Jesus, then his faith is vain as far as God is concerned. When Paul addressed the Israel in Romans 10 and verse one, they had faith. As a matter of fact, they intended to have faith in God, but they had a faith misdirected because they had not stopped to pick up God's new set of directions. And they wanted to have faith in God through Moses' system, having not understood that that system is no longer valid. So what makes our faith vain is if the object of our faith is not Christ, and if the intensity of our faith is not what it should be, and that will make your faith vain and useless and worthless. Next question. Can you be sincere about your faith and still be wrong? Absolutely. 
Sincerity never validates whether one is right or wrong or not. Several years ago, uh, my sister lives in Memphis and I was traveling through Memphis. I was living in North Carolina at the time. She didn't know I was in town. The television station was playing these games where they would call people and say, if you can answer this question, you can win this. So I stopped at a payphone and I called her and I disguised my voice and I said, I'm whoever the guy was from the television station. I said, if you can give me the name of Roy Rogers horse, you will win 500 big ones. And she just started, just got so excited and she blurted out, Trigger, which was the name of Roy Rogers' horse. And I said to her, you have won 500. And she started yelling and screaming on the phone and yelling and screaming. And I said, you have won 500 pounds of trigger manure. She didn't hear that. She actually thought I was the television personality. She was so excited, I started trying to get her attention to tell her, this is not the TV personality, this is your broke brother. Now she was sincere, but she didn't get the information. First of all, I was not the TV personality. And number two, I never said $500. I said 500 pounds of trigger manure, but she was sincere and sincerely wrong. So we've got to make sure that we get the accurate understanding of the word of God. Over and over again, people are sincere and sincerely wrong. My suspicion is that those whom Paul talks about in Romans 10 and verse 1, they were probably sincere, but they were sincerely wrong because they had not come to embrace that the righteousness of God was in Christ Jesus, not in the law. Okay, uh, the next question is from uh, Brother Dale Jeffrey. I believe he's from the islands, I believe. But anyway, so his question is, why does Paul refer to Jesus Christ as the righteousness of God? Because he is the righteousness. When Jesus came into the world and lived the perfect righteousness, lived perfectly righteous, then God assigned to Jesus everything that's assigned to himself. So Christ is the demonstration of the righteousness of God. And so God uses Christ to clothe us in his righteousness. And so that's why Paul would make that statement. Uh, Second Corinthians chapter five and verse number 17 will give us uh, a verse number 18, I believe it is, will give us uh, some further insight into that for the sake of time. He starts talking about we are new creatures in verse 17. We are reconciled in verse 18. And then in verse 19, uh, he has uh, uh, committed to us the word of reconciliation. And then verse 20, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So Christ is who he is by divine assignment from the heavenly father. And then also why is he referred to the end of the law for righteousness? Well, the, the law wouldn't, never make a person righteousness. What he is saying is that Christ is the end of the time when people appeal to the law to be made righteous. Under the law system, they would come to the tabernacle, offer their animal sacrifices, and the only righteousness that they would receive was through that sacrificial system. So Christ is the end of that system of righteousness. He is the end of that system by which you depend on the law to bring about righteousness, though the law really never made anyone righteous, but he is the end of that system. And that apparently is what Israel had not come to embrace. For whatever reason, they had not come to the point where they could accept that their righteousness was going to come through Christ. They just couldn't fathom that. Remember one time they had a discussion with uh, Jesus, and they said, you know, we are Abraham's seed. And, and Jesus said, 
you really are not Abraham's seed because Abraham was telling you about me. So it's, it's not new. You really aren't doing what Abraham said, even though you think you are, because Abraham uh, talked, he, he pointed forward to my coming. Brother Jeffrey said, thank you for that explanation. So the last question that I have, um, Brother Marshall, is how can you respond to a person that says, God put this on my heart to tell you this? God put this on my heart to tell you this. If what they tell you is consistent with scripture, then I usually say to those people, he really didn't have to tell you. I could have found that by reading it. And if it is inconsistent with scripture, then I say to them, this is confusing. He said one thing here, and then he said something else through you. How do I know which one of you all are telling the truth? I prefer to go with what he said first. Since he put scripture before he told you, I'm going to stick with scripture. That's what he said first. Now that's my kind answer. I could kind of tell them that, you know, he really didn't tell them anything. I could really just let them know how hallucinating they are. But, you know, in my older age, I've gotten nicer than I used to be. <laughs> but I do think that what we need to learn to do is to stand our ground and argue adamantly for what the text of scripture say. You may feel this, you may believe this, you may even seen something you thought that worked but I'm taking my stand on what's written and revealed in the word of God. Because if God is giving us a contradictory message, then we can't trust him. Thank you. That's all the questions that I have, Brother Harris. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brother Marshall, is there anything that you didn't get a chance to say that you would like to say? I think for those who are teaching students, teaching folk, appeal to scripture. Appeal, when you're teaching people, challenge them to look at the word of scripture, the phrases, the sentences, and the verses. Doesn't matter what they see, you keep calling them back to what the scripture did. Johnny Cochran won a court case by continually saying, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. He didn't let them move him away from that. And that stuck in the eye, in the mind of those jurors. So you gotta make people see, if you decide to go with your feelings, then don't criticize me because I'm going with the word. If you decide to go with what your preacher said or your mother, your grandmother, or, or whatever, if you had a vision or you think you've had a vision or you heard a voice or something, I'm going with the text of scripture. Uh, it, it is like traveling and you have it, you're listening to your GPS and someone is in the car with you. You have to make a decision. Am I gonna listen to the GPS or am I going to listen to the person in the car. Now, if your GPS, and I know every now and then that's not a totally adequate illustration because GPS sometimes malfunctions, but scripture doesn't malfunction. So don't, we gotta stop being embarrassed to stand on the word of God. We gotta stop being embarrassed for people to say, oh, you too intelligent to believe in the Bible or, or you too intelligent and, or there's been some revelation knowledge and, there's an update. We've got to take our stand on the word. Here's a time when, when people, uh, an illustration to help us to see that. If you buy a house and you have a 30 year mortgage, when you bought that house, they did a survey and plotted out your boundary lines for your property. 30 years later, when you paid off that house, you expect everybody to listen to that 30 year old document and honor the boundaries that were set 30 years ago. If man can set some boundaries and they are to be permanent, 
then shouldn't God be able to set some boundaries that are permanent? And we need to stand there. And I think we're getting to the point where we have too many people and even some preachers who do not have the courage to stand on the word of God. Now we can have a discussion about whether my understanding is accurate, but at least we ought to be pursuing a most accurate understanding of the word of God. And when we arrive at that conclusion, do not allow anybody to embarrass us away from it. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Marshall, for a very fine message and for uh, the way in which you have handled the questions. I appreciate that so very much. Let me share with you uh, what's coming up next. Uh, next week, we will be uh, looking to continue this series. And our speaker for next week is Brother Robin Mitchell. And he will be speaking on the subject, put you on the Lord Jesus and make not provision for the flesh based on Romans chapter 13 and verse 14. And we look forward to the message that he's going to bring us uh, at that time. And as we look down the road, uh, following him, uh, the text on joy in the midst of the storm uh, will be presented by Brother Theodos King. And we have a host of speakers lined up uh, who will be coming after that. Uh, we have Brother uh, Robert Maxwell, Brother Dr. Billy Moore, William Jones, Chauncey Thompson, Leonardo Gilbert, Lamont Ross, Jonathan Gibbons, and uh, all of these men will be following with uh, some wonderful, superb messages. The team has selected a series of topics, and all of those topics uh, will be coming up in order uh, in the next uh, eight weeks uh, following uh, tonight's message. And so uh, we look forward to having you back. Pass the word, share it with someone else. And uh, if people want to know what is going to be talked about, we're going to be dealing with effective communication, uh, civil rights, racism, injustice, and protest. We're dealing with premarital relations, marriage, divorce, and singleness. We're dealing with the power to change or overcome some lifestyle choices. Women in the COC in the 21st century, homosexuality, LBGTQ, and time management as a Christian. And then uh, when we walk through these, I have an exciting list that have been uh, passed on to me by the committee and they will be following up from that. We want the word of God to go forward. I want people to be touched on every avenue and aspect of their lives, that God has an answer, that God has a message for us, and that God has salvation to all who's willing to be saved. And look forward to uh, the time that's coming ahead. Again, Brother Marshall, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And just as we prepare to uh, close for this evening, I'd like to ask Chris Long to lead us in our final prayer. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. All right. If you will bow for me, please, as we go to the throne. <clears throat> Dear Almighty, gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we just thank you for another wonderful day in your kingdom. Uh, understanding that we're simple creatures, we don't deserve of uh, the blessing you have given us, but we are <clears throat> thankful for you seeing past our faults. Uh, Father, I want to thank you for the uh, effort of uh, Dr. Lord Harris and uh, his effort in trying to get everybody together to discuss these matters. Uh, we thank you for Brother Marshall, who gave an excellent word. Father, we thank you for his dedication uh, to the word and his studies, Father. Thank you for Sister Bell for hosting this event, Father. We thank everyone for, who, are, who participated in this event. We just thank you for their work and their effort, Father. Uh, we thank for everybody on this call. Uh, we know there's a lot of things we could have been doing, places we could have been. But we just thank you so much that we all decided to come together collectively uh, as the saints, Father, not forsaking the assembly. Well, I continue to bless us all, Father, as we move forward uh, in this life. Let us always try to uh, <clears throat> let you continue to guide us, Father, stick to the word that you have uh, let us, uh, left us, Father. Let's continue to uh, be an example to the world of, of <clears throat> how Christians should be, Father. Let us be a light unto others, letting them see uh, just how truly blessed that they could be, Father. I continue to be with us all, Father. We just ask you, uh, <clears throat> if it's in your will, Father, wake us up tomorrow, Father. Give us another chance, Father, to uh, draw nigh to thee, Father. Give us another chance to do the best that we can to continue to fulfill our charge of uh, saving souls and keeping souls saved, Father. Continue to bless everyone here, Father. 
Until next week, Father, we thank you so much for everything you've given us. Uh, let the saints say amen. amen. Thank you very much. Uh, Maddie, back to you. Okay, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, Brother Marshall, a great message, and a lot of people have put that in the chat that they really enjoyed your message. I really admire your ability to be able to just explain uh, the Bible in such a clear way. So thank you for that. So um, like we said, next week, we're going to have someone very special uh, presenting, and that's going to be my second dad, Brother Robin Mitchell. So make sure you join us next Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. Um, we will be here and we will have this message available uh, via Facebook and YouTube here in the next couple of days. So be checking for that. So thank you all again for joining us and you all have a great night. Good night.